I'd like to uh, read, please, from Matthew chapter 6. Be our first of two readings, Matthew chapter 6. And if you want to follow along, we'll be uh, beginning at verse 25 and reading to the end of the chapter. Matthew 6 and verse 25, I should at least tell you that uh, the title for the message is The Bible Cure for Worry. The Bible Cure for Worry. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25, Jesus is speaking. This is part of what we often refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. And he says in Matthew 6 and 25, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, or don't worry about your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, by worrying, can add one cubit unto his stature, or one hour to his life, as some translations say? Which of you, by taking thought, by worrying, can add one hour to his life? And why take ye thought for raiment? Why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory, that is his glorious robes, was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven or into the fire, Shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, or do unbelievers seek? For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought. Don't worry about tomorrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Now just one other reading, please, over to the epistle to the Philippians. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4, we'll break into the reading at verse 4. The Apostle Paul writes in Philippians 4 and 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Now we have the same expression Jesus used now that Paul uses. Be careful for nothing. Don't worry about anything. But in everything, by prayer, and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known unto god and the peace of god which passeth all understanding shall keep or guard your hearts and minds through christ jesus finally brethren whatsoever things are true whatsoever things are honest whatsoever things are just whatsoever things are pure whatsoever things are lovely whatsoever things are of good report if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. And we look to the Lord to bless these readings from his word and trust that he will give help in saying a few things from them. In May of 1995, a man by the name of Randy Reed, a 34-year-old construction worker, was welding on top of a nearly completed water tower outside Chicago. Reed unhooked his safety gear to reach for some pipes when a metal cage slipped and bumped the scaffolding on which he stood. The scaffolding tipped, and Reed lost his balance. He fell 110 feet to the ground. 
landing face down on a pile of dirt, just missing rocks and some construction debris nearby. A fellow worker saw what happened. He called 911 and the paramedics arrived and they actually found Reed conscious, moving, and complaining that his back hurt somewhat. But he was fine. Apparently, the, the fall didn't cost uh, Randy his sense of humor because as the paramedics carried him on a backboard to the ambulance, he had just one request for them. He said, please, whatever you do, don't drop me. <laughs> there he is, three feet from the ground, and he didn't want to fall. Meanwhile, he had fallen 110 feet, and he was okay. Sometimes I can be a bit like Randy Reed. Maybe you can as well. We have been saved from the big fall, if you will, from the consequences of the big fall. God has saved us from sin. He has saved us from judgment for our sins. He has saved us from something so big it, it couldn't be any larger. And yet, maybe today, you're concerned about something so much smaller. Well, I think that happens to all of us. We worry. We worry about things that are sometimes very small. And we worry so often. And sometimes the worry is very irrational. Is there anything that we can do about it? And sometimes worry is, is actually very debilitating. Is there a cure for it? So I want to speak about the Bible cure for worry. Sometimes I go into the bookstore and I see these little booklets called the Bible cure for asthma and the Bible cure for diabetes, the Bible cure for uh, all sorts of ailments. And I'm not sure that I necessarily believe that they're really Bible cures for any of those things. But I do know that there is a Bible cure for worry. And when we read the words of the Lord Jesus and the words of the Apostle Paul and, and listen to what they have to say, I think we can be 100% confident that there is a Bible cure for worry. Now, first, I want you to think about uh, the diagnosis of the situation, diagnosing worry. What is worry? What is worry? Because isn't it okay to have concerns about certain things in life? Absolutely it is. Yeah, because there are some people that don't seem to worry about anything, right? They just, they, they're not concerned about the situation in their family, the situation in the country, in the world. Nothing seems to upset them whatsoever. And they don't really care about anyone either. They go on in a very self-centered way, not thinking about anyone else. It's fine to have concerns about things related to the kingdom of God. Jesus said in Matthew 6, when he's discussing worry at the end, he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We need to have concerns about important things in life. But there's such a thing as, there's such a thing as uh, a rational fear, and then there are irrational fears. But there are rational fears. Maybe you heard about the, uh, the hitchhiker who got picked up, and uh, he jumped into the back of this man's truck, who gave him a lift, and he couldn't help but notice that in the back of the truck there was a coffin. And he didn't think too much of, about the fact that the coffin was in there. It started to rain. And in order to get shelter from the rain, he got into the coffin. And it was a it was very nice coffin. It was padded very well. And after a couple hours in, in that coffin and out of the rain, he fell asleep. And what he did not know is that the truck driver stopped a couple more times and picked up two other hitchhikers who were now in the back of the truck and the rain had stopped. Well, eventually the man in the coffin woke up and uh, he lifted the lid and he sat up. And as you can imagine, those other two hitchhikers were gripped with very rational fear and they jumped out of the truck and they fled. There's such a thing as rational fear. But there's such a thing as irrational fear. And that's usually the kind of fear that grips us and causes us to worry about so many things. And if you're anything like me, it usually happens at about two o'clock in the morning. Two o'clock in the morning, you're, you're 
afraid of this and you're afraid of that and you don't know if this is going to happen or if that's going to happen. There is, there is irrational fear. You've probably noticed how many times this little phrase is found in the Bible. Fear not. Fear not. I am the Lord. Why is that phrase found so many times in the Bible? Because we have so many irrational fears, right? They, they grip us in the middle of the night sometimes. We can't get back to sleep. We fear the unknown. We fear losing something. We fear losing, maybe losing someone. We fear the future. We're not sure how this is going to turn out or how that is going to turn out. We worry. We worry. And Jesus said repeatedly in Matthew chapter 6, don't worry. Don't worry about your life. Don't worry about food, drink, clothing. Don't worry about tomorrow. Those are the three categories that he lays out, which covers nearly everything in life. So what is worry? What is worry? If we're going to determine the Bible cure for worry, we have to know what it is that we're diagnosing. Well, interestingly, the English word for worry, English word for worry comes from an old German word, which means to choke or to strangle. So the worry is an emotional chokehold, an emotional stranglehold uh, that, that is on our lives. And I think that's a, a very good way of describing it. The Greek word that Jesus uses here in Matthew 6 is from two words, make, com, com, composed of two words, which means to divide and the mind. Therefore, a divided mind. So an emotional chokehold, that's in the old German word. The Greek word is a divided mind. And if we put that together with how Jesus diagnoses worry in this very chapter, I think that simply stated, you could define worry in this way, that worry is a lack of trust in God when it ought to be present. Worry is a lack of trust in God when it ought to be present. I'm going to try to make the case for that in just a moment based on what Jesus says. But the Lord Jesus repeatedly tells us in Matthew 6 not to worry, not to worry. He says that your father feeds the birds, right? He says, he says they don't sow and they don't reap and they don't store in barns. And yet they have something to eat. Your father provides for them. Aren't you, aren't you more valuable than they are? And he, he speaks about the, the flowers. He says they don't spin. They don't toil. And yet Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. God provides for the flowers, for how they appear, for the quote-unquote raiment that they have, right? You're better than flowers. You're better than the birds of the air. He says, he says your father knows what you need. And then he adds these words. This is why I come to the definition that I've stated. Jesus says, oh, you of little faith. Oh, you of little faith or little trust. And by the way, when Jesus speaks about little faith, he, he does it quite a number of times with his disciples. I don't think that he means little in amount. I don't think he means little in amount because you remember there was an occasion where Jesus said, if you had faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, you could say to that mountain, move, and it would. It's not little in amount. It's little in duration. Little faith in duration. In other words, the disciples, they were, obe they were trusting in him one moment. They would see a miracle that he did, and they would have confidence in him and trust in him, and the next moment it would evaporate. And he, I think it was part of the frustration that they did not display consistent, steadfast faith, continuous faith in the Lord and the Lord Jesus and what he could do. But So worry is a lack of faith, a lack of trust in God when it ought to be there. Now, I don't want to jump ahead to my last point, but you can see already then that there is that the cure for worry the cure for worry involves then something that will instill faith in us. If worry is a lack of trust in God, then the cure has to be able to instill trust in the Lord. 
And there are things that we can do that will do just that. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Now, in part of this diagnosis that Jesus gives us of worry, uh, he points out a number of problems uh, concerning worry and why they should not be a part of our lives. Now, some of us are more prone to that than others. But for one, worry is worry is very self-focused. Worry is very self-focused. So G Jesus says, don't worry about your life. Don't worry about what you will eat, what you will drink. Don't worry about your body, what you will put on. Worry is very self-focused, isn't it? It's all about me. What am I going to do about this? And what am I going to do about that? And Jesus says at the end of the chapter, he says, seek, you, you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. That's one of the, one of the problems with worry is that typically it, it causes us to be very self-focused. Our focus needs to be off of ourselves and on to the things pertaining to the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So one problem with worry is that it's very self-focused. Another thing Jesus brings out here is that worry is very useless. It's quite useless. I, in fact, I don't think that you can do anything more useless than to worry. Worrying about things doesn't fix anything. It doesn't solve anything. It doesn't provide any remedy to any situation. Look at what he says in Matthew 6, 27. He, said, he says, which of you by worrying can add one hour to his life? Not possible. I don't doubt that by worrying you could subtract an hour, <laughs> but which of you by worrying can add one hour to his life? It's not possible. It's, it's useless. Worrying doesn't accomplish a thing. It is self-focused. Jesus says that it is useless, and, of, and he says it is worldly. Verse 32 of the chapter, he says, or after all these things, in these ways, in these ways, do the Gentiles, do the unbelievers act? This is what, this is how the unbelieving people in our world act. To worry is to act like those who have no faith at all, right? And so Jesus gives us this diagnosis of worry. Now, the second thing I want to emphasize, I just have three points. The second one is preventive care, preventive care. Now, there are some very practical things that we can do to prevent worry from getting a chokehold on our lives, right? From getting that stranglehold on our life. There are things that we can do. So I should try not to add things or events to my life that will increase my worry or anxiety. Now, I'll give you a, a humorous example or two, but we can't do it right now anyway, but people actually will pay money to go and sit in a theater to be frightened. And back when I was a kid, it was, uh, everybody wanted to go see Friday the 13th part, who knows what, I think they did a, a number of them. And and they would they would be in the theater screaming and, and, and and anxious and and people will go and people will go and pay good money to go to amusement parks. I happen to be one of them. And we get on these rides, right? Rides that have G forces that rival space shuttle launches. And and you're in the line and you're getting closer, right? And and you're starting to count how many more minutes you have until it's your turn. And then the, the, you're starting to sweat and you're getting anxious. Now, well, why do why add that anxiety to your life? Now, those are just humorous examples. Some people actually enjoy these things. But any other preventive care we can follow when it comes to worry that, that, that's a serious one. How about the news? How about listening to the news? How about watching the news? Don't you just feel great after watching an hour of news? So that now, in addition to worrying about your income, worrying about your family, worrying about the assembly, worrying about your job, worrying about your grades at school, worrying about how you're going to pay off your school loans or any of your other debts. Now you can worry about COVID-19. You can worry about how many cases there are in the country and how many cases there are in your state or your province or your city. You can worry about the violence that there is on the streets or the deteriorating state of our country. And then you'll see footage of tornadoes. I even saw footage of a fire NATO. I think shark NATOs are fake, but, uh, fire nados and tornadoes and we had two hurricanes coming into the gulf of mexico at one time and now we have another one that's 
moving along. And I wouldn't be surprised at some point we're going to turn on the news. Ladies and gentlemen, there's an asteroid headed for Earth. We all have about 10 minutes left. Go ahead and say your goodbye. It's almost to that point, right? You know what you can do? Just turn it off. It's called preventive care. And sometimes we need it to give us less to worry about. I don't know if our brains are capable of being able to manage all of the news because so much of it is bad that comes in to the brain at any given point in time. There's the news, there's social media. And then you scroll through all these issues on social media and, oh, I didn't know that about this person. Oh, that's terrible about them. Or that's wonderful about them. But then you're envious about what you're seeing. And then you work, you can worry about your parents and how you can be and how you're being perceived by other people. And then, of course, there's conspiracy theories multiplying about this, that, or the other thing, and you're reading that you can just stop. It's called preventive care. And I think we all need it. We all need it. We've already got so many things that could cause us to worry. We don't need to add more things than we can handle. Now, some preventive care is very basic, very basic. You might remember, you remember the story of Elijah. In 1 Kings chapter 19, when after a great victory over the prophets of Baal, he is suddenly running, fleeing for his life, running away from Queen Jezebel, who wants to destroy him. And he sits down under the juniper bush, right? And he is worried about his life. Matthew 6, don't worry about your life. And in fact, the worry intensifies so much that he's, he's ready to be done with life. He's worried about the condition of the the nation of Israel and how he thinks he's the only one left. He's got so many concerns and they're pressing down on him and the discouragement reaches an apex when he asks the Lord to just let him die. Well, God eventually speaks to Elijah. Do you remember what God's first words to Elijah were? He doesn't say, you know, you, uh, you need to dust off a copy of the scroll of such and such and, and read the word of God. No, and what he says, arise and eat. That's what the angel said. Arise and eat. Get up and eat. That's pretty basic. And then after he gives them some basic preventive care for what he was struggling with, then he does speak about more spiritual matters. The Lord said to Elijah, he says, listen, you've got to get up and you have to anoint Hazael to be the king over Syria. He told him that he would have to get up and anoint Jehu to be king over Israel. And he tells him that he needs to get up because he's going to have to anoint Elisha to be a prophet in his place. He's got work to do. And that work, that work would involve not something focused on himself, but something that would be focused on others and lifting them up, lifting them up. I I heard this uh, the other day, a 10-step plan for dealing with discouragement, with with worry, anxiety, and discouragement. 10-step plan for dealing with discouragement. Number one, do something to help someone else. The top of the list, number one. Number two, repeat step one nine more times. (laughs) Repeat step one nine more times. Do something good to help someone else so that you're not focused on yourself. Right? Uh, I actually heard that when, when you do enough of this, you actually obtain something called the helper's high. The helper's high, where you're, sorry to say this uh, in a meeting, where you can get high on helping someone else. Now, if you were told that you could get high, just make sure that you explain what you mean by that, but by helping other people. Now, I know that this works, and I'm sure that some of you know that it works too, because if you've ever been down, if you've ever been running low, and you had something to do in service for the Lord, you go, maybe you speak, maybe you serve in some other way, and you come back, and you're not down anymore. You're up. You're up. I've seen it in people that I know. I've seen it in my family members. I've seen it in my wife. I've seen it in my children. And they're down and they go and they serve and they come back and they're not down anymore. There are things we, there are things we can do as preventive care 
so that worry and anxiety will be less likely to overwhelm us and drive us into the pit of despair and discouragement. But I've saved the cure for last year, just building up to what? So there is a, a, a treatment plan. There is a treatment plan, a Bible cure for worry. What is it? So I'm going to give you four things, and they come largely from Philippians 4 now. Four things that we can do if we want to have the cure for worry. Now, again, what is worry? If worry is lack of trust in God when it ought to be there, because we are, as his people, we are believers. We are believers. We are people that have put our faith in the Lord, our faith in Christ for salvation. And so we ought, we ought to be able to put our faith in the Lord for other things. He saved us from the biggest of all. And there are things that face us today that maybe aren't so big, and yet they're able to get us down. So what we need, what we need are things that we can do that will build us up in our faith. That will instill faith in us. What are those things? Well, for one, now we didn't read this, but this is the big one. Paul says that we need to read the word of God. That we need to, and it needs to be the right kind of reading of the word of God. Why is that part of the treatment plan? Because Paul says, the Apostle Paul says in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So faith comes when we hear God speaking to us through his word. Now it needs to be the right kind of reading. I say the right kind of reading because I think we've all experienced the wrong kind of reading where by the time we're finished, we don't remember anything that we just read. <laughs> and later on we go, where am I reading again? What was it that was in that text? The right kind of reading is to allow God to speak to us through his word. Listen to what God is saying. Hear him speak to you from his word. And when we hear God speaking to us, when we learn God's ways, and, God, and when we see God's promises, and when we learn about God's faithfulness, and that he keeps his promises, we have all of these, all of these incidents in the Bible where he did keep his promises. When we read God's word, we gain confidence that he is in control of everything. We gain confidence that God is able to work all that is happening in our lives for good. Even if those things are troubles and trials. In fact, Romans chapter 8, we love the verse, right? All things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. What, what does he have in mind there, Paul? All things work together for good. You know what the ultimate good is? That we might be conformed to the image of his dear son. That's right in Romans chapter. The ultimate good is conformity to Christ, likeness to Christ. And so to the extent that troubles and trials and even tragedies translate into conformity to the image of God's son, then that is good. That those things will work together for good. So we read the word of God. We read the word. We see his ways. We learn about his character. We learn that he is in control, that he is sovereign. And we see that he keeps his promises. You know what happens? Our faith is built up. We gain confidence. We gain trust. We are built up in our faith. And so the Bible cure for worry involves, first of all, the right kind of reading. We can read all kinds of other things. We can read other books. And I've got lots of books behind me that I like to read. But it's the reading of the word of God and the understanding of his word that will build us up in our faith. The right kind of reading. Number two, the right kind of praying. How we enter Philippians 4. The right kind of praying. Not just, see, there's a wrong kind of praying. I don't know if we call it praying at all. Where we just go over our list, right? And we have this running list of all the people that we need to pray for. And we say the exact same thing today as we said yesterday, as we said the day before. And we might have an additional item to just verbally mention when our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed. And we're... There's the right kind of praying. And Paul says, this is it. First of all, he says, come to God. That's obvious. 
Philippians 4, let your request be made known to God. To God. There's a time that we can come to other people with all of our concerns, with all of our worries, and all of the things that trouble us. But when we're worrying, we need to come to our God. He says, come to God. He says, speak to God. Let your request be made known to God. Speak to God. I sit there at two o'clock in the morning. I'm lying there at two o'clock in the morning. And I'm just thinking about all these things, right? What am I going to do about this? And what am I going to do about that? And what if this happens? And what if that happens? David, <laughs> speak to God. Let your request be made known to God. Bring them to him. Speak. Come to him and speak to him. So Paul says, speak. To, and Peter actually says uh, in his first epistle that we can cast all our cares upon him. For he cares for you. When you're troubled, when you're weighed down with troubles and worries, cast it all upon him because he cares for us. Tell the Lord everything that's troubling you. You always feel so much better when you do, right? Come to God. Speak to God. The right kind of praying involves thanking God. Thanking God. Paul adds, he says, in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known to god he's careful to add that with thanksgiving why is that important you're entering into the presence of god and and you might not be thinking you're just talking you're going over the list think about things to be thankful for think about things that are answers to prayer. God has answered prayers. Thank him for those answers. And when we thank God for past answers to prayer, you know what happens? We gain confidence that he will answer our prayers now. We gain trust. We gain confidence. We are being instilled with faith. It is a faith-building exercise to give thanks to the Lord for answered prayer. I remember... Uh, some of you probably remember Mr. Oswald McLeod. Uh, he was a preacher who lit in, lived in our area until he was 99. I remember he would get up on Wednesday nights for our prayer meeting and he would pray. And he could pray for a long time. And he, could, and he prayed for a lot of people. And I remember as a young, younger person thinking, wow, this is taking a long time. And then you get a little older and you go, but it's quite remarkable that someone could think about that many other people other than himself, that he could think of the needs of that many people and bring them to the Lord. But he always started out, the reason I'm telling you this, he always started out with thanksgiving. He would say, Lord, we come with thanksgiving. And he would thank the Lord for answers to prayer. Thank the Lord for blessings. And it was, it's, a, it's a good thing to pray with thanksgiving. Paul says so. It will build us up in our faith. It will give us confidence that he will answer our prayers because he's answered them in the past. So Paul says the right kind of praying is come to God, speak to God, thank God, and then, by the way, leave it with God. Sometimes we have a bit of a problem with that. Leave it with God. I think it was Martin Luther who said, pray and let God worry. Pray and let God worry. Now, God can't worry, but that was his point. Leave it with him. Leave it with him. And when we do this, Paul says what the result will be, verse 7, and the peace of God shall guard your hearts and thoughts or minds through Christ Jesus. Our hearts and thoughts where worry festers will be guarded by the peace of God. And so there's the right kind of reading and there's the right kind of praying. And then there's the right kind of thinking, the right kind of thinking. We need our thoughts guarded. So what should we do? We bring it to the Lord. We cast all our cares upon him. And Paul says, in their place, there are things that will be worthy of your thoughts, worthy of your mind. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is, by the way, he says, whatever is true. A lot of things we worry about aren't even true. There are things that are just never going to happen. We worry about this, that, and the other thing. They're never going to happen. He says, whatever is true, whatever is worthy of respect, whatever is just, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, 
whatever is commendable, whatever is excellent or praiseworthy. Think about these things. I confess it's so easy to fill my mind with the cares of this world. Cast your cares upon him and replace those cares with thoughts worthy of a place in your mind. And Paul gives us a good list, the right kind of thinking. The last thing, the last thing that he points out is the right kind of example. It will build us up in faith if we have the right kind of example. And what example was that? Paul says, verse 9, and what you learned and received and heard and saw in me do these things. I think Jesus may have said it this way, right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Paul did. Paul did seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he could point to himself as an example and say, do those things, those things that you have seen in me. He was the example for them. Surround yourself with people that are not manifesting unbelief. Surround yourself with people who are people of faith. I know that there are people watching now. I know probably, I think I know many of you that are watching right now, and you're people of faith. Surround yourself with others that are people of faith, people that have gone through things and they have confidence in God that he is going to get them through, that he is going to be there for them, that he is going to provide for them. And you know what happens? That becomes contagious. When you see examples of faith in other believers' lives, it will help you in a time of crisis to be able to manifest such faith as well. And when we do all of this, when we do all of this, Paul comes to this conclusion in verse 9. He says, he says, and the, the result will be this. The God of peace will be with you. The God of peace will be with you. A mind, a life at peace. That sounds pretty good. Sounds pretty good to me. It's hard to worry when we have the God of peace with us. And the peace of God in us. So there's a Bible cure for worry. Now I admit it's far easier to prescribe than it is to follow. But sometimes we're more likely to follow the remedy when we know what the problem is and why the remedy will work. I'm sure you've been to the doctor before and you've gone, you've got a certain ailment or a certain infection, and the doctor will prescribe something and then say, Describe to you how it's going to work. And when you know how it's going to work, you'll be more likely to take the remedy seriously and consistently and just as it has been prescribed. I admit it's easy to per easier to prescribe this than it is to follow, but may the Lord help us all to follow his treatment plan and not allow worry to bring us down.